Right, good morning. This is my second attempt at recording this video as the one I put up yesterday had uh, dodgy sound. Um, so I've turned off most of my sound little gimmicks here. So you can probably hear lots of kind of like oh, breath and background noise that you wouldn't normally hear. But on the plus side, you should be able to hear um, all of the words that I am saying. Um, this is video three in uh, a three part series looking at the relationship between branches. In um, part one, we looked at how the ju judiciary interacts with both the executive and the legislature. In part two, we looked specifically at how the legislature legislature interacts with the executive or how the legislature tries to control the executive. And in this final part, we're going to be looking at how the executive tries to control the legislature and indeed how that relationship may have changed over time. And as many of the textbooks say, and many of the political kind of writers say, it is the tension here between the executive and the legislature, which is, the, is at the core of the British political system. And the, the rise of the judiciary is a relatively new thing since the uh, uh, creation of the Supreme Court about 10 years ago, um, but it is this relationship here and how it, it how it changes, how it how 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 one part becomes more dominant and less dominant uh, according to a whole range of factors that is that is at the core of the British political system. And if this relationship was to ever completely break down, then you might well have what we call a constitutional crisis, which is what many people thought was happening under the Theresa May government. However, that is debatable, and we can discuss that in class. So this video is looking at how the executive attempts to to control or influence um, the legislature. These are the 10 uh, things I'm going to be talking about today, or the 10 factors, and we're going through them uh, hopefully relatively quickly uh, in this video, which is aiming to be about half an hour long, um, giving you some examples and talking about how um, it may or may not, in fact, control the executive. Um, I may at some point do a fourth video uh, that kind of looks at this as an overview and kind of talks about how these all these factors interact. But in a way, that's kind of what you're there for, is to kind of evaluate these and kind of think about which of these you think are the most um, effective and the least effective and, and, and so on. Okay, so the first way that the government seeks to control the parliament or, or the legislature, because that, that is the same thing in the British system, is that the, the government or the executive, remember the word government and executive are also interchangeable. So during this video, I will be using the terms executive and government interchangeably, and I'll be using the terms parliament and legislature interchangeably. Um, and when I say prime minister, I will also be kind of referring to um, the executive and the government probably. Um, so the government always has an inbuilt majority in the, in the House of Commons because that's just how the system works. Whichever party has um, the most amount of MPs, the leader of that party becomes the Prime Minister and then that Prime Minister is invited to form a government um, by the Queen. Um, and as you can see here, and this I'll be referring to this diagram here quite a lot, um, this is the 2019 Parliament. Each blue blob represents a Conservative MP, each red blob represents a Labour MP, MP, SNP, Lib Dems, and some of the Irish Nationalist parties and, and various others. Um, and what you can see here is that not only do the Conservatives have the most amount of MPs, they have the most amount of MPs that outnumbers all of the others combined. So it's not just that the Conservatives have more than Labour, it's that the Conservatives have more than Labour plus the SNP plus uh, the Lib Dems plus, plus all the others. And that's kind of how our system essentially functions or doesn't function is that our electoral system, which we will be studying um, later in the year, um, tends to produce an overall majority in Parliament, which means that the Conservatives, as long as they are united and as long as they work together, can overrule any objections by all the other parties put together. So how does the executive control Parliament? Well, mostly just by always having a majority in Parliament. Parliament. Uh, we have a fusion of powers in our system, which means that our, our government, our prime minister, our cabinet, our ministers are all sitting in parliament, but so is their, is the rest of their backbenchers and, the, and their party. And so most of the time they will be able to win votes, whether that's votes on um, new legislation, whether that's votes of no confidence, if one is called, whether that's votes on military action, most of the time the government will win their votes because most of the MPs are of the same party. Of course, it doesn't always happen. Go back to 2010, we had a coalition government because actually there wasn't a majority by one party. Go back to 2017, we had what was called a minority government, which meant that the Conservatives were the largest party, but they just didn't quite outnumber um, all of the other parties combined. And so 
though Theresa May had to make a deal with the DUP, not a coalition, but a uh, what they called a supply and confidence agreement, I think was the was the phrase that they used. Um, so it doesn't always happen, and we can talk about those case studies um, another time. Link to that, of course, each one of these little blobs here is in fact a, and on both sides, each one of these blobs here represents a real human being, a real member of parliament who has their own thoughts, opinions, beliefs, ideologies, um, etc. And at any point that MP can vote with the government or against the government. But the whips over there, um, it is their job to make sure or to try to the best of their ability to ensure that each MP votes with their particular party. So there are Labour whips trying to ensure that the red blobs vote along with Keir Starmer and his ideas, and there are Conservative whips trying to make sure that the blue blobs vote along with Boris Johnson and whatever his ideas are. Or if you're watching this video in the future, whatever, whoever the Prime Minister and the Executive um, is there. Because MPs don't have to vote with their parties. It's almost like it's a cultural thing and it's a, it's a whipping thing. And in the UK, we have quite a strong whipping culture where our MPs are very strongly encouraged and perhaps even expected to vote along with their with their parties um, different in America um, they although they are they are becoming more partisan in America there's a lot more independence there's a lot more kind of free uh, freedom for representatives to kind of vote this way and that way on on, on various issues but the uh, the picture there is Gavin Williamson who you probably know best for uh, um, I was going to say screwing up your exams, but that's probably that's probably unfair um, for being the current education secretary. Uh, but he used to be the chief whip, and he was photographed last year with a whip on his desk, uh, as a reminder to perhaps his previous um, roles. Uh, and the whips will try and influence MPs to vote this way or, or that way, and they might do so by offering rewards, they might do so by threatening punishments, um, or they might do so simply by persuasion, uh, by talking about what the actual issue is and why it's important and how it might help the government they might kind of say well Boris would really appreciate it or Boris would really not like it if you did that um, and we'll come back to those ideas a little bit later but the the whip's job is to try and find methods by which they can persuade their MPs to vote with the government most of the time which of course then becomes another way that the executive can control um, Parliament. Number three Again, these, the ones at the top are all, all kind of have a link in that what they keep coming back to is this idea of how to win these votes. Uh, so you'll see a kind of a, a familiar theme here coming up. Now, this is called the payroll vote. Now, this goes back to the, the Houses of Commons. Now, we've, we've discussed this before, but you should know that we have, let's just talk, we're just talking about the Conservative Party in the House of Commons here. You should know that you have one Prime Minister, then you have about 30 people in the Cabinet, and then we have about another 60 or so people who are members of the government, but they are junior ministers. So they are members of the government, but they are not actually part of the cabinet or the prime minister. And then you have another 200 or so backbenchers. So out of all of these blue blobs here, about 100 of them, maybe slightly less, are actually members of the government, um, either cabinet ministers, junior ministers, or other particular roles. And this has become known as the payroll vote, because according to collective cabinet responsibility, um, Government ministers are always expected to vote with the government, and if they don't want, wish to, uh, they have to resign, or if they want to publicly disagree, then they have to resign. Which means that anyone that is a minister or has an extra responsibility um, will be voting with the government almost straight away, unless they disagree with something so strongly that they are going to resign, which is a very, very rare thing to happen. It can happen, but it's very, very rare. And this has become known as the payroll vote, because it basically means that the, the bigger that the Prime Minister can make the government, the more people he can put on the payroll, this phrase here, um, the more kind of guaranteed votes he has in the bag for any kind of legislation or... Um, uh, or bills that might be coming coming through or other kind of awkward votes coming up and he or she can even try and influence difficult members by offering them roles in government as well. So, so, so say you're the Prime Minister and you have a particular member who that you know disagrees with you on certain issues, offer them a job. 
offer them a job, get them on side, get them in the cabinet or at least into a junior ministerial position. And then you're almost guaranteed because you now have them as part of the payroll vote to vote to have kind of bought their loyalty by offering them a job. And of course, ministers, whether they're junior ministers or cabinet ministers or senior cabinet ministers, um, not only is this additional responsibility, not only is this additional power, it's also money. Just, just to be blunt, it's, it's, it's extra pay, um, which means that if a minister was to vote against the government, they would lose their job, they'd lose their responsibility, they might have torpedoed their career uh, in the long term, and they will lose money. And for people with families and bills and all that kind of stuff, that, that's, a, that's a big deal. So this payroll vote um, is kind of a nickname for using, enlarging the government to try and make sure that you get more votes on, on, on side. So again, this payroll vote is another way of trying to ensure that this government majority over here controls parliament. This one is one of the ones that I have increasingly become aware is very, very important. It's, it's dry, it's dull, it's really important. MPs don't turn up every day and go, hey, what should we debate today? And they don't turn up uh, and the speaker goes, oh, well, today I think we should talk about Brexit or today we should talk about Corona. Um, the government decides what is debated every day in parliament and what is voted on every day in parliament with a few exceptions. But by and large, most of the time, it is the executive that controls what is debated, what is voted on, how much time each bill gets, and so on. And this is a huge power, because it means that the government controls which bills go through Parliament. So, so, so say the government has got 10 bills that they really want to get through, they will just go to the timetable and they will write on, well, we're debating this one this day, this one this day, Here, here's the vote, here's the vote, and, and off they go, and they just put it on the timetable. They don't have to ask the legislature for permission to do this. Um, they don't have to influence them to do so. They don't have to persuade the speaker. They just do it. They have control of the parliamentary timetable. Um, and the, the, the opposite is true as well. So if there's something that they don't want Parliament to discuss and don't want Parliament to debate, um, they just don't put it on the timetable. Um, this was one of the things that Theresa May uh, battled when she was Prime Minister, is that Parliament was kind of screaming, you know, let us debate these other options, let us debate a second referendum, let us debate this, and, and Theresa May refused. The story gets a bit more complex after that, and I probably need to do that one as a particular kind of case study, but there was this idea of parliamentary timetable became very obvious during the Theresa May era, because MPs were saying, we want to, to be talking about other things, we want to be debating this or looking at this bill, and because the executive house has control of the timetable, they more or less weren't able to. There are a couple of exceptions here. Um, you saw in the other video, there's something called the Backbench Business Committee. So for 35 days a year, um, other parties can control the parliamentary timetable. Um, but 35 days is, is not the same as controlling it all the time. <clears throat> Excuse me. And there are limits to what that can be done on those 35 days, but it's better than nothing. Um, if you compare our system to the American system, Congress is complete. Congress's timetable is completely independent of the executive. The American Congress sets its own timetable. And yes, often if Joe Biden wants the Congress to discuss something, they'll add it to the timetable. But they don't have to. Um, and and so that makes the dynamic between the relationship very very different. And it's one of the key changes between the American separation of powers and the United Kingdom fusion of powers. And our last one on the top row again, and this again comes down to this idea of government majority, and, and all, hopefully you can see here the links between all these five things at the top here are basically about ensuring that the government can get their legislation through and, and win votes. The last one is the power of patronage. Um, the One of the powers that the Prime Minister has is the power to create ministers and fire ministers. So this is, this is very closely linked to this idea of payroll vote and this idea of whipping. But the Queen asks the Prime Minister to become the Prime Minister. So the Queen asked Boris Johnson, do you accept to become Prime Minister? And Boris Johnson probably said, oh, yes, I do. Thank you, Your Majesty. And, um, but it is then the Prime Minister that chooses all of the other ministers. And he can hire them at any time and he can fire them at any time. Um, or she. And obviously hiring and firing has consequences and a prime minister needs to be careful how they use that power. And that was one of the topics we looked at during the um, executive module. And I've got some additional high level read higher level reading on that if anyone's interested. Um, but 
Imagine you are a brand new MP, you're a Conservative MP, you're, I don't know, 30 years old or whatever, you've just arrived in Parliament. Um, you want to be a minister one day. Like, your career is going to, you know, every every job really kind of has a, a hierarchy of, of some kind. And, you know, so say I'm, I'm a teacher. I used to be a junior teacher, a trainee teacher, and then I became a, a proper teacher, and then I became a head of department, and now and now I'm a, the head of e-learning, and other teachers go off and become assistant heads and all those kind of things. So, so there's, every job has a hierarchy you, to which you move up. And if you're a member of parliament, your hierarchy is very much based on the idea of becoming a minister of um, becoming a sorry I'm just noticing a big clonk there when I tap my mouse hopefully the sound on this is fine because this is the second time I recorded this so I, I really hope it's okay um, if you're an MP your whole career path is in your mind is almost certainly based around the idea of wanting to become a minister one day which means you don't want to be upsetting the person who can give you that job. You need the Prime Minister to like you, respect you, to, to think that you're competent and to think that you are loyal, which means that when the whips will be kind of making their various kind of conversations, conversations about patronage will be there. You know, do you think that by rebelling against the government here that you will be in line for a ministerial position someday? Uh, do you think, Minister, that actually the Prime Minister would consider you for a higher office if you were to support the government here? Um, and, and the same kind of works in, in reverse, that if, you, if you're being kind of disloyal and, and talking against the government, then you could lose your patronage. So the, the power of patronage is very important because it decides the career path of MPs, and it's a wonderful way for the executive to influence yet more of the MPs, not just the ones that are in the government, but the ones that hope to be in um, the government. Um, it was very noticeable once Theresa May started getting into trouble uh, 2018, 2019, loads of MPs, including Gavin, Willi Gavin Williamson, actually, um, flocked to Boris Johnson. Pretty Patel, Gavin Williamson, uh, who else? Um, Chris Grayling. Um, lots of them, once they saw the way the wind was kind of blowing, they flocked to Boris to show their support to Boris. Oh, Boris, we think Boris should be the great leader. Why? Because they then expect Boris to be have control of patronage in the next government and he did um dominic raab was another one and and so so he boris rewarded that loyalty by giving out senior jobs and is there something wrong with that i don't know perhaps you could kind of debate that one yourself but a prime minister will want loyal colleagues that will support him um but it does show a, a touch of cronyism that is is in all kind of jobs really okay let's go into some some a bit more kind of complex ones or a bit more kind of rare ones um this is almost like the nuclear option um, for, a, for a party leader. You can throw your MPs out of your party. It doesn't often happen, and it would be pretty dodgy if you did, but it has happened, and it's actually happened more, recent, more often recently. Um, uh, a prime minister cannot throw an MP, uh, cannot stop an MP being an MP. An MP is elected by their local, sorry, all my, all my, um, notifications are going off. Um, the Prime Minister cannot say, right, you're no longer an MP. They don't have that power because an MP is elected by their local constituency. But what they can do is to say, well, you're no longer a Conservative MP or you're no longer a Labour MP. You're no longer in my party. And this has happened uh, a few times. I'll give you two examples. When uh, Jeremy Corbyn uh, got in trouble a few months ago for over anti-Semitism claims, Keir Starmer threw him out of the Labour Party. Um, I'm not sure what the current situation is with it, but for a while at least, Jeremy Corbyn, despite being the ex-leader, was no longer a Labour MP. He was an MP. Um, another example, when Boris Johnson came to power and there were some Conservative MPs that rebelled against his Brexit deal, he showed a zero-tolerance approach. He threw, I think it was 53 Conservatives temporarily out of the Conservative Party, including um, the ex-Beaconsfield MP Dominic Grieve, who the photograph is of there. Um, now, of course, this does come with consequence. You might be kind of thinking, well, why doesn't the Prime Minister do this all the time? Well, because, think about this number here, this blue number here. For every MP you throw out of this blue block, you're increasing the number here and just because you might you might not like what the MP is going to vote on on issue number one but actually you still need the MP for issue two three four five six seven eight nine ten etc so this is a power and this is why this power is very rarely used because a Prime Minister 
needs his MPs to win votes. And of course, MPs are friends with other MPs and kicking an MP out of a party is a, is a huge thing. And you're not only likely to lose that MP, but also those that are close to them and, and so on. You know, it's a big deal. But ultimately, that power is there. Oh, and it has happened, especially Boris Johnson has been a lot more willing to use this power than other leaders. Um, and so Google that and have a look at those stories if you'd like to know more. This one's very different. So ways it, executive can control the parliament. Oh dear, control the parliament. That should probably say, that should probably say the legislature. Oh gosh, I didn't realize that title was so uh, badly written. Um, secondary legislation is a way that they can almost bypass parliament. So the way secondary legislation works is, and we talked about this briefly when we talked about the executive, I think, is that um, legislature, primary legislature, which is what we've studied, as you know, has to go through the House of Commons and then the House of Lords. And it's quite a long process where you have lots of debates, lots of votes, lots of um, uh, kind of discussions. Then there's the committees, all the various committees and so on. And it's a long, expensive process with lots of scrutiny. And we probably agree that that's a good thing because it means that the new laws that come in um, have been hopefully properly evaluated and discussed before they become law. However, sometimes a law might need minor tweaking and doesn't necessarily need all the scrutiny. And probably the most useful example here is the Misuse of Drugs Act 1971, I think it is. You might want to Google that in case I've got the date wrong. But basically, the Misuse of Drugs Act 1971 makes a whole bunch of drugs uh, illegal and criminalizes them. But of course, the drugs that actually need to be illegal change over time. You might be aware that cannabis has gone up from, I think, class B to class C, back to class B. There are brand new drugs being made all the time, which then are added to the um, to the to these lists. Um, like I think ketamine was one of them a few years ago, and 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 so on. And the government shouldn't really be sending a brand new law through Parliament every time they want to criminalise a particular drug because they'd be doing it all the time. And as I said, it's an expensive, long process. So the government uses something called secondary legislation, or it's sometimes known as a statutory in instrument, which, which tweaks the existing legislation and makes minor changes to it, kind of keeping within the, the flavour of the initial primary legislation, but making minor tweaks, such as changing which particular drug might be illegal or adjusting a speed limit or something like that. Um, however, there, it, it is unclear exactly when it can be used and when it can't be used. And so Boris Johnson tried to use secondary legislation uh, a few months ago to try and adjust the terms by which Northern Ireland was part of the Brexit deal. Um, I can link you to that story if you're interested. And lots of people said, whoa, 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 that's not a secondary legislation thing. That's a primary legislation thing. Um, so one of the, so the point here is is that secondary legislation is one of the ways that the government can try and bypass, just kind of go around Parliament, um, and so much so that actually now the House of Lords has a, a uh, I think it's a, I'm not sure if it's a select committee or whether it's just a committee that actually specifically looks at secondary legislation and scrutinises it and tries to stop the government kind of. Um, getting things passed in this way, um, or at the very least making sure that it's been scrutinised and examined and uh, questioned. Oh, and by the way, the secondary legislation is sometimes known as Henry VIII powers. If you want to like to know more, and I would suggest always Googling around after these lectures, uh, Google um, Henry VIII powers Brexit um, and look for something that came up in the last few months and you should find an example of secondary legislation. I've talked a lot about select committees and, and, and liaison committees and backbench business committees and all those kind of things, and they're a really good way of scrutinising legislation and departments, and they have been relatively effective. Um, however, there is one issue that committees have, which is that the makeup of the committees, i.e. the 16 or so members that are on these committees, always reflects the makeup of of Parliament. So, for example, you would never get a committee that had nine members of the SNP, one Conservative and two Labour. That would, wouldn't happen because the balance of Parliament is not that way. And the idea here is, is that democratically, representatively, the committee should represent the voters and therefore the committee should represent Parliament. But of course, what this means in practice is it means all committees actually have a government majority on them. Or to, to put this in a very, very short, blunt way, all of the committees have more Conservatives on them 
than than any other. Um, there may be some exceptions to that rule that I'm not aware of. But this does mean that, assuming this picture was taken under a Conservative government, that probably most of the people sitting in front of whoever is a witness there, might even be David Cameron, um, are already Conservatives, which means they're probably more likely to be friendly and not necessarily want to kind of do too much damage. But maybe that's a good thing. Maybe it, it's a good thing that the select committees represent the public or maybe it's not such a good thing because it means that actually the scrutiny will be limited because there are inbuilt majorities for the government. Now, if you go and look at some of the select committee stuff, you'll see that actually many of the MPs that become select committee members are relatively independently minded anyway. And I'll, I'll refer you back to the, the Junior Lewis, Chris Grayling example from my previous video that talked about how the select committees very much tried to remain independent. I'm just going to turn the volume down on my uh, iPad, which keeps delightfully interrupting me during this video. Um, so. This isn't a black and white issue where I can say definitely they are effective or they're definitely not effective, um, but it's definitely something to um, consider that uh, the inbuilt government majority uh, means that they that they are less. They're not just a, a constant break on the government. I probably explained that badly because I got distracted. I'm sorry. Um, Again, countering the previous video, um, if you remember in the previous video, there is now a convention that by uh, that the royal prerogative powers, such as military action and foreign treaties, now have to be subject to a vote in Parliament. So Boris Johnson wants to go to war tomorrow. There is a convention that says he must then put, have a vote in Parliament. And this tradition started, I think, under Brown or Cameron. It was somewhere around there. And it's kind of more or less gone up to today. However, conventions can be broken, and conventions only exist as long as all the people involved are conventional. Boris Johnson, Donald Trump, a lot of recent politicians, they're not very conventional. And uh, uh, I think Theresa May did actually do one bit of military intervention without sending it through Parliament, something to do with Syria, if I remember, but she justified it by saying that there was an earlier vote that, that um, went along similar lines. And uh, so there is the control that Parliament has over things like military military intervention is limited to the strength of the pressure there is there to have a convention. Um, so you can debate that one. The, the exception here perhaps is the Fixed Term Parliament Act, because if you just think about that phrase, the Fixed Term Parliament Act, that is actually a law. That's not a convention. So the government cannot get around that one without winning a vote in Parliament. But of course, look at the top line. They normally can win a vote in Parliament. And lastly, um, in the previous video, the last thing I pointed out was that the House of Lords can try to slow down and prevent and block the government in, in many ways, um, or, or, or um, simply provide an alternative viewpoint. But the Salisbury Convention means that the House of Lords tends to let anything that was in the government's manifesto go through uh, and not vote against it. Quick recap of what that means is, whenever there's an election, a party, political party produces a manifesto, which is a book, that basically says, I, Boris Johnson, or I, Keir Starmer, promise to do this, 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 and this. Uh, this on the environment, this on the police, this on Brexit, this on education. Uh, here is my list of promises. Please elect me to be the government. And then the voters, me and you, will probably not read the um, the uh, ma manifestos, but nevertheless, they are there if we want to read them, and we vote. And then a government wins, um, and then the government will go about trying to put the promises that were in their manifesto into, into law over the next five years. The Salisbury Convention says anything that was in that manifesto, the House of Lords shouldn't touch, because it now has what we might call a democratic mandate. The people have voted for this manifesto, and therefore the House of Lords, which is not a democratic body should not stand in its way, um, which means that the House of Lords tends to be a lot more active on new ideas that the government comes up with after being in power for uh, a certain amount of time. However, the House of Lords has continued to be relatively active over issues such as Brexit and the internal market bill from last year, which they ping-ponged with the government with, you could argue was in the manifesto because Brexit was obviously Boris's big, big promise. Let's get, let's get Brexit done. Um, so the House of Lords culturally has become more likely to break the Salisbury Convention, although you wouldn't say yet that the convention had broken down, maybe in the future. So there you go. So compare this video to the previous video. Think about the ways the legislature can control 
um, the executive. Think about the ways that the executive can control parliament. It is a complex relationship. Like if I go back to the the uh, the kind of the pie chart, you it, you cannot really just say this is stronger or this is stronger. It is a complex relationship whereby at different times on different votes on different ideas with using different methods different branches have more control um, and that kind of like bumping along together is how our political system works feel free to ask me questions uh, read around on your textbook about this and your revision guides um, you don't have to have a clear understanding of which one is stronger you have to have a clear understanding of how the executive might influence the legislature how the legislature might try and influence the executive and have a bit of a kind of a thought on where you think that relationship is at the moment and how it might have been different under Theresa May these are the kind of the thoughts that you need to be kind of um, thinking about and having views on. I hope you found that interesting. I did. I think it's a fascinating topic and I'll see you in class.